you do literally take your clothes off for the bank and it's not <laughs> yeah. always that pleasant. No. Quite unique in New Zealand in that sense. We go into some real depth when it comes to getting a home loan. Especially um, now. Yeah. And people are embarrassed about it. If it's, you know, it might just be the fact that their alcohol bill is high or they drink a lot of coffees or two trips overseas each year. Sometimes they know that that's not the norm and that they yep. they do feel a little bit conscious of it. So good morning and welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. Today I'm joined in studio by Andrew Chambers, who's a CEO of Teller, which he'll be telling us a little bit about in a moment. Welcome to the studio. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Thanks for having me. Oh, absolute pleasure. So we've just been having a bit of a chat about, you know, your background and you mm. are a 20-year career banker who mm. then went out on their own to start their own business. Yep. Would you like to tell us a little bit about that that journey and, and why you did that? Yeah, okay. Well, um, to start off, I think I'll explain that I am an accidental banker. I didn't ah. intend to get into banking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, when I left school, actually, I'm in a sound room now and I was I did audio engineering. So oh, that's interesting. <laughs> um, and I went off on my OE to the UK and as you do, you sort of go for where the pay is when you end up in the UK and I got into financial services there with insurance mm-hmm. and came back to New Zealand and went to a agency to look for a job and they said when can you start and I said today and they said I've got a job at ANZ for you. <laughs> so, and, that, and that was the first banking job. That, that was my first banking and job. And you stayed with ANZ for a long time, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, so um, that was 1995 and I, um, I ended up being there to 2014. So yeah, I had a full career there in banking and pretty much all facets of it in a way. I started in um, migrant services, which was looking after migrant banking, liaising with all the offshore branches that ANZ had, had um, cash flows coming from offshore around those migrants and bits and pieces. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I went into um, corporate banking and worked my way up into various roles, got to that sort of relationship level, um, went offshore and did the same thing with ANZ in the Pacific and, yeah, I just um, kept moving basically through the organisation to um, a sort of more senior role managing people in corporate in New Zealand, so... Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Yep. Hmm. And so then after that, um, you did switch for a little while, didn't you? You went to a yep. slightly different banking role. Yeah. So um, my exit from ANZ was to um, join the establishment team in China Construction Bank when uh, the th- three of the Chinese banks entered the market in 2014. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that was um, head of commercial for New Zealand for China Construction Bank. Um, and I stayed there for a 12-month period, which was basically the establishment period, but decided during that time that um, I should try and do something for myself. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and so so from there, what happened? Yeah, what, you, what was your thing for yourself? Yeah, so um, I guess when, when you've got 20 years in banking, you, you often think about what you could do better or how you could help your clients better. Mm-hmm. Um, you also have a lot of relationships, so I was very lucky that I built a good number of um, client relationships over that period. Um, and I, I knew a lot of bankers, particularly in ANZ, that were at that same point looking for a new challenge and, and something that um, would give them a bit of life, actually, because you, you, you kind of probably get a bit stale after, <laughs> uh, you know, a couple of decades of in, in banking. Yep. Um, so... Um, with a um, ex colleagues started Eightfold, and brought in a couple of other ex colleagues to kind of establish a bit of a team there. Eightfold, um, it's a debt advisory business, but it focuses on the individual, so the relationship point. Um, and if that's a business owner, it's about looking after everything that they need from a debt point of view. Mm-hmm. If it's a professional, it's it's potentially about. Um, understanding the firm that they're in and the dynamics of that, but also the personal property portfolio they might, the individual um, professional might have or their family needs or the whole lot. So it's sort of about um, we don't deal obviously with publicly listed companies, but we deal with everyone from a, um, a owner-occupier needing a home loan through to a corporate business looking to move banks. So quite a r- array of um different needs in there really mm. Mm. Yeah. and so there was four of you when you first started but you've now mm. got what 16 17 somewhere around 16 to 18 people yeah <laughs> yeah so we have seven advisors um 
in total, plus an insurance advisor. So in, on the debt side, mm-hmm. um, we have seven. Um, one insurance advisor that helps around the life insurances, which is a nice tie into the the group that we have and those customer needs. And then we have a, a bunch of um, of good people assisting to make all that come together support in the background. People. So support people, admin. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so that was, if I'm right, that was back in, when was that, 2005, was it? Uh, that was 2015. 15, 15, so, 15 sorry. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah, so that's, um, yeah. Seven years ago. Yeah. yeah. And so yeah. so on that journey, and we'll come back to Teller in a moment because mm. that's the, the, the mm. newest baby, but mm. on that journey so far, what are the things that you've been most proud of, uh, both professionally and personally? Uh, yeah. So I'm proud of the team. I mean, it's an awesome team, really good experience. They put a lot into the customer relationships and making sure those outcomes are good for the, the customer base. Mm-hmm. Um that comes with the feedback that they get, and I'm very proud of that sort of feedback that we get from the banks themselves and others that we deal with, our suppliers, yeah. as well as the customers. Um, but it's nice when you, um, yeah, I mean, we haven't, we, we've had so much wonderful sort of positive feedback over the years, and that's the stuff that really drives me. It's having delivered for a customer that makes the yeah. the day great. Um so, yeah, I think that's probably um, uh, the biggest driver for all of us, actually, as a business, yeah. is just um, getting those out- outcomes for for our clients. Um, and I think it's been – the environment's got harder and harder to get those outcomes in. Mm. So it's also sort of been able to be technically good at what you do to be able to keep up with all the change that's been going on. Yeah. Um, o- over the last 10 years, we've had – uh, a lot of regulation come in. Mm-hmm. We've had a lot of um, conservatism come in uh, across the banks, compliance come in. Um, there's been a huge uh, knowledge drain, I think, across the banks. So we've had to pick up um, and change to kind of account for that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, a lot of challenges, and we've kept up and kept going. And Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. And so I've got to ask, because I used to be working in insurance, <coughs> mm. and if I told you that, mm. but I used to work in insurance. And so, you know, going from the security, and let's face it, the good pay that comes mm. in working in insurance and banking, to going out on your own, that mm. was a massive kind of leap of faith. Yeah. Um, tell mm. us a little bit about that journey. Yeah, I guess um, that's the biggest challenge, isn't it? Going from the stable um, salary yep. <laughs> <laughs> to the unknown. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that was probably the biggest leap of faith I've done in my career. Um, but I think I probably uh, had reached a period or a stage in my life where I was financially secure mm-hmm. and knew that I could, you know, um, worst case in that scenario was downsize or do one of those sorts of things. Yep. Um, I wasn't overburdened, if you like. So that gave me that comfort. Yep. Um, but I also knew that I had some um, great people and um, that we all had some great relationships um, around that. So, yeah, I think um, that sort of gives you some security. Yeah. Mm, mm. Okay. Yeah. But, I mean, it, that we talk about, you know, the hockey stick growth of a business and we mm. know that never quite happens quite like yeah, that. Yeah. What were the sort of little hiccups or challenges you faced along the way in terms of getting started? Because uh, it is think, very different working in a corporate where you've yeah. got everything done for you, people surround you yep. to do all the various bits and pieces to yep. suddenly running your own business. Yeah. Um, I think what you don't know, um, when you're in a corporate, you're kind of naive about quite a bit, really. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so for me, um, just... Um, the administrative functions, bookkeeping, um, dealing with accountants, um, all the things that you thought were really simple and you asked of your clients <laughs> when you're a corporate relationship manager, actually, yeah. you realize that they take time. Mm-hmm. Um, and time's your enemy as a small business. You just, you know, you're always chasing your tail on time. Um, so I think that's probably, um, yeah, it's the, the, I guess that, it, that r- relativity between income and time is you don't see it when you're working in a corporate, but you do when you own your own business. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So was there any times where you actually kind of wondered, you know, what on earth have I done or has it all been reasonably smooth sailing? Um, no, I often sort of, you know, you have your bad days and you sort of think, um, you know, I wouldn't mind sort of not having to deal with certain things. Um, yep. But I'd never 
consider going backwards. No. I wouldn't go back to a corporate. Um, and often the challenge is, um, you know, you, 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 you may have to deal with something in a small business that you didn't have to deal with in a corporate because you become a generalist. Mm-hmm. And you don't enjoy all the elements of that. You just, you know, it's hard to, yeah. um, you know, dealing with GST or something like that um, is not necessarily going to be pleasurable, but it has to be done because it's one of the things on the list. Yep. Um, but then you kind of get past that and think about the the bigger picture and what the business has done and, and the enjoyment you've had from it and you get past it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you move on. Yeah. Have you ever had any um, people challenges? Because, you know, sometimes when yeah. you kind of go out on your own and you uh, – we often start off employing people that we, we know or yep. family yep. and the yep. business grows and suddenly it grows them. Tell me a little bit about some of those challenges. I, th- I, think, I think the people challenge is always the biggest one. Yeah. Um, and um, for me, I kind of always expect that everyone's going to be like me, and they're not, and that's that's the starting point. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's totally natural. Yeah. Um, and then there's the sort of, I think what um, you know, you you get good at identifying certain um, qualities and issues in terms of I've got better at recruiting. I think over the years, I know what works and doesn't work so much. Yeah. Um, both from a um, a role perspective in terms of what uh, we need in the people, but also through to sort of the fit and um, making sure that that person coming in is um, a good fit in terms of the team and all those sorts of things. Mm-hmm. So I think um, I um, probably have better processes now too in terms of that um, acquisition of people piece. Uh, yeah. But, you know, it's... Um, Again, you know, I did a lot of recruitment and banking over the years. Yes. But the risk isn't as great if you get it wrong, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And so it's yeah. like, and the time cost is, is um, not such a concern. Whereas if, you know, we've just done a, a role for Teller, um, 130 applicants down yeah. to seven, down to uh, three, down to one sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And it takes a lot of time, yeah. you know, and so you've got to get it right. You can't kind of um, muck up on it and be changing someone out in six months' time. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, just you don't want to be. Yeah. You don't want to be. Um, <laughs> yeah. There's a number of reasons why not. Um, so, yeah, you do have to get better at doing that sort of stuff than you would in a, in a corporate scenario. Mm. Yeah, so tell me a bit about Teller. So Teller is the, is the, latest, um, yeah. the yeah. latest launch, if you like, and, yeah. and that was an idea that came to you. Well, years ago, is that yeah. right? But you yep. really solidified it yeah. during the lockdown, is that right? Yeah, yeah. So I think actually it comes goes back to my banking career where um, in banking over the years, we uh, I got sort of hauled into doing project work, mm-hmm. um, new CRM, new term deposit tool, you know, all these sorts of things that come up. But they're always so clumsy uh, in terms of the way they were um instigated and uh, those projects were so expensive to run and yeah. it took years to do and um, you often got a mediocre sort of outcome. And so I've always been, since leaving banking, I've always sort of been tempted to look at doing something in that tech space and I had a couple of goes at sort of starting something w- around digitization of the mortgage early on with Eightfold um, but um, didn't quite have all the tools I needed, I think. Yeah. Um, and then in the lockdown of the first lockdown of was it March, March 2020? 2020? Yeah, yep. remember it fondly. Um, it sort of it dawned on me that if I'd had that tool or that set of tools in terms of being able to um, digitize that loan process and allow people to apply online and upload docs online and do all the um, kind of pre vetting themselves, mm-hmm. it would have been a wonderful scenario to have through um, a pandemic. Yep. So um, at that stage, I had a bit of um, lockdown time on my hands, I guess. There was a few things that weren't happening. <laughs> yeah. And I sort of got a big pad out and started thinking about how it might work. And um, fortunately, I had met um, Stefan, my business partner, who is a tech entrepreneur a few years earlier. And he was also kind of keen to um, look at the digitization of financial services as a whole, really, in New Zealand. Um, and he'd done a number of investments in that space and other businesses. Mm-hmm. So um, together we sort of got started um, and st- started with building a tech team. So we're a bit unique in that sense in that we decided that we needed to own our technology. Yeah. Um, 
So we started with one, yep, <laughs> as you do, and we've now got six, and uh, we've built from the ground up. Um, and they're all New Zealand based too, aren't they? All which New Zealand is really based. unusual. Yeah, yep. yeah, um, yeah. Very unique, and and in the same space as the rest of the business. So. Mm-hmm. They have had to learn about our industry. Um, they're getting really good at home loans. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it, you don't get that quite if, the, you know, um, a tech team operating in another country or another office. or yeah. yeah, so it's quite unique from that sense. Um, so, yeah, we've built out a, a device platform for home loans that allows people to do what they did with a mortgage broker essentially in the past. Um, they can do it in their own time and on their own terms to some degree. Mm-hmm. Um, so the application process can all be done, done online. The supporting information gets uploaded online. Um, they can start with, we've got an amazing library of information um, to learn from. Yeah which um, I'm really proud of. I think it's probably one of the best in the country in terms of a single place to go to to find information about getting home loans. Nice. And it deals with the first home buyer, the owner-occupier, the investor, the parents that are trying to get their kids into a home. It's got the whole suite of information there that um, suits different scenarios that people have, really. So yeah. that's designed to prepare them so that when they go into the process of yeah. doing the application, they yep. know what to expect and, and yep. how to best position themselves that's to get right. the best deal. Yeah. Yep. And then there's um, tools, so there's calculators um, that they can go in and actually look at affordability, um, mm-hmm. look at what repayments would look like, um, look at the cost of refinancing, those all those sorts of different bits and pieces that they might want to look at. Nice. Um rates which is kind of essential but <laughs> yeah so they can see where the market's at and what banks are doing and all those sorts of things um and you know backed up with video and other bits and pieces to to try and uh, make it easy for those that don't want to uh, read but would rather watch so yep. yeah yeah okay. um and yeah so the unique thing i think with teller is that it's not um restricted by geography um you know, I could be sitting in Wanaka and decide at 11 o'clock at night I'm going to start the applying process. for a home loan. Yep. I don't need to try and find out who the local mortgage broker is or, um, uh, you know, uh, what who's safe to deal with, who to talk to. Um, I don't have to book an appointment. I don't have to go in to see them or go to a branch or whatever it might be. Yep. I just get in and do it online. And that's kind of... Um, you know, what, what, one one of the things that I said when we launched is, it's not that our customer base um, thinks we're new; they thought we already existed. Right. I feel you know yeah, it's like yeah. surely that's already surely, online. Surely, yeah, that's right. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. So it's sort of like I think we're kind of although we're the the first to sort of roll out such a um, end to end product in New Zealand. Mm-hmm. I think the market probably, you know, particularly in that sort of under thirty under 40 area, yeah. they probably thought it already existed. Yeah. Um, so the first time they go to get a home loan, they're probably going to go online and search for this tool anyway. Sure. Um, and hopefully they find Teller. Yeah, mm. no, that's great. Mm. And so you talked about this this new person that you're looking at, 130 applications, is that what I heard you say? 130 applications for a job, yeah? Yeah. Was that yeah. one of the tech people? Or that was, was the a designer. Designer, so, okay. Yeah, so that's um, – we've – Contracted out our design piece actually over the last couple of years, and we're yep. bringing that in house now. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's amazing actually. Um, quite staggering. I wish we could get that with developers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was going to say because my understanding, I was thinking if it was developers, it was um, it was quite fascinating yeah. because they're in quite short supply, yeah, aren't they? It's been incredibly hard to get yeah. developers. Yes. Um, and actually, to be fair, I mean, I, I we got 130 applications for designers. I would say a third of those required sponsorship. Okay. So the you know you take them out. Yep. Um, and then you know um, probably a third don't have the um, skill set required. So you you quickly get down and and yeah. so uh, yeah I mean labour and access to it is still you know a major problem for us. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you know I think for a lot of businesses now the insurance is offshoring and other bits and pieces. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, it's it's kind of 
I'd like to keep as much of it here as we can, particularly around the the areas that are quite sort of sensitive in terms of IP and bits and pieces. Yeah. But at some point you sort of go, we probably are going to have to look at um, outsourcing. Or a hybrid model potentially mm. of some mm. offshore and some local. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, so you, you said that you've managed to refine your um, recruitment process, mm. if you like. Mm. What are the things that you've done to make it a, a bit easier for you or to, to make sure you get the right person? Yeah, so um, the screening piece is probably um, a bit deeper than it used to be. Yep. And obviously there's that screening at a kind of um, intro letter, resume level. Yep. But um, what we do a lot more of now is sort of standard testing. Um, and um, if I use the developers as an example, we've, um, what have we done? One, two, three, four front-end developers in the last um, year or so. Yep. When we go through that process, we've put them all through the same um practical testing so you actually start to get a really nice feel um, because you've got benchmarking against the peers that have come in already Mm -hmm. against the ones we didn't hire Um, so we're using a lot more comparative tools in that sense um, and not changing that model and keeping it consistent you know um, developers are are unique because they're kind of code driven and all that sort of stuff but you can start to get a really nice handle on um, where someone's at Mm -hmm. and what they're going to need in terms of future development and bits and pieces. So, yeah, but you also get to see their personality. I was going to say, because the technical aspect's great, but what about their personality? How do you make sure they fit in with the team? Especially because they're working, as you said, within the same office as the the lone people, so they're not just a whole team of developers. So that testing, it it gives you an idea of how they cope with um, projects and and being under pressure Mm -hmm. and time frames and all those sorts of things, communication skills, um, and that's really good. Um, But the other thing we do um, with everyone now is we, um, the last interview they have is with the team. Right. So we pick a couple of members of our team um, and we get them in the room to actually see that... um, you know, what's the feedback? Did they like them? Did yeah. they not like them? Did they think they fit in? Do they, you know, just the basic human stuff. Yeah. Um, did um, did they show any weaknesses or flaws or, um, you know, are they, potential issues? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so there's a, a bit more of that than we have done in the past too. Okay. Yeah. What do you think has been the biggest challenge in, in growing both of those businesses? Mm. Would you say? Um. Yeah, it's probably people, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is no surprise. No. <laughs> um, and um, I think um, particularly the last few years hasn't been great in terms of stability. Mm. Um, I think that there's a sort of double-edged sword with flexibility that we've got at the moment. Um, we've been through an environment where flexibility was needed to to manage a pandemic, yep. but when you give too much flexibility, it becomes an insecurity almost. And I think there's that balance to be had, particularly with um, with people that need routine, and that's not everyone, but no. it's a good chunk of humanity. <laughs> yes, <laughs> around um, this kind of idea of flexible workplaces over um, that traditional model of rigidity. Mm-hmm. And so it's finding that nice happy medium that kind of works for people. Um, that's been challenging over the last few years. Yeah. Um, work from home versus being in the office, collaboration, how that gets affected, um, creativity, how that gets affected, yeah. all those sorts of things. Um, so I think that's probably been, I mean, the people bit's always um, the biggest challenge, but it's also um, the leadership team being able to um, create that vision and the, the direction and all those things that those people need too. Yep. Um, and, I, and I guess coming back to small business versus corporate, um, I think in the past in corporates, middle management's t- played a huge part in those organisations around leadership and development of people and direction yeah. but it's always the first thing to get eroded when times are hard it's the easy layer to take out mm-hmm. in a small business it's really hard to put it in because you just don't have the <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the, um, the um, budget to do it right yeah. um, but you know I think having that um, 
traditional sort of triangular shape organization versus a flat structure has a lot of merit and I think that's been lost a little bit in um, recent times so from a people point of view I think that's something that I'm constant, uh, conscious of um, beyond that um, big challenges are keeping up with regulation yes and we've had a huge amount of regulatory change over the last 10 years um, we now have training um, requirements for our people we've got to keep up with um, uh, compliance like we never have before and make sure that we're on top of record keeping and all these sorts yeah. of things um, and a lot of those are kind of an opportunity for us with what we're doing with our technology yep. so making sure that that's much more automated um, and accessible and all those sorts of things um, and automated to make it more personal right because yeah, people are yeah. scared of automation they say yeah. oh, we're all going to become robots but I yeah. actually believe that if you can automate the the basic stuff it gives people the opportunity to actually personalize and humanize the, yeah. the, the valuable stuff but I think it's also giving back um, giving back to the customer the choice mm-hmm. Um Whereas I think that had got a bit lost in financial services and, and that's where the issues have come with advice being provided in banks around insurances and things like that is if you if it's the blind leading the blind, yeah. then often it becomes a kind of binary thing rather than a, a situation where the customer has a choice. And I think that's with digital, you can do that really well because mm-hmm. you can actually um, pr- provide that sort of questioning line online and you might do it in two different ways to get the same answer to make sure that you actually are doing what they want. Right. Yeah. But you can you can do clever stuff like that to actually reinforce the decisions that um, a system's making, if you like. Sure. Um, but I think um, the other opportunity there is that uh, advisors in general have less time to spend on clients because they're spending more time on the compliance the side. Compliance side. Yeah. So, you know, better systems means that they potentially get some, back some of that client time um, and actually have time to provide good advice. Mm-hmm. Um, so giving them the tools to do that, really. Yeah. Um, I think it's hard because more regulation doesn't necessarily mean better outcomes from an advice point of view. Yeah. And, in fact, I'd say today versus five years ago, um, the people that need advice are probably getting it less and the ones that don't need it are the ones that get it, <laughs> um, <laughs> yep. which is a hard one. Yeah. Um, again, if I look at a system like Teller, I think Teller is good for um, the non-bank, the, the individual that's not getting the advice, um, the individual that knows they've got a problem and is looking for help around um, solving it, but potentially is embarrassed also about that. Um, online offers quite a lot for those people. Yeah. Um, you because know. you haven't got to be sitting in front of somebody kind of you yeah. know, head, head, in, head in hands shameful about what's been going on. Yeah. You can have the conversations yeah. a little bit more, uh, what's the right word? A little bit more removed, but yeah, still yeah. able to have it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you know... Um, as Stefan, my business partner, says, you do literally take your clothes off for the <laughs> for the bank and it's not yeah. always that pleasant. No. Um, and, um, yeah, we're quite unique in New Zealand in that sense. We go into some real depth when it comes to getting a home loan. Especially um, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and people are embarrassed about it. If it's, you know, it might just be the fact that they, um, their alcohol bill is high or they drink a lot of coffees or they have, two trips overseas each year sometimes they know that that's not um the norm and that they yep. they do feel a little bit conscious of it you know mm-hmm. so yeah yeah um yeah it's it's i think digital does sort of have some um real pluses around helping people that um would otherwise not necessarily want to open up to an individual mm. I think it's important. We were talking about Teller before. I mean, it's not all fully automated, right? It's no. about automating the stuff that just needs to be done so yep. that you can then spend the time working on yeah, the things that need to right. be dealt with. Yeah. So you've still got a human at the end of the, the line who is going to help you through that process, yeah. who's going to talk you through, yep. um, give you the advice that you need. Yeah. So we've got a team of home loan specialists and um, they're all qualified advisors mm-hmm. um, and they sit there um, 
to pick up the phone, but they've also got live chat there, so they're often answering questions in live chat. Um, they're still vetting everything that goes through, so it doesn't mm-hmm. go to a um, to a lender until it's gone Ready. through a vet, and mm-hmm. just to make sure that everything adds up and makes sense, and that there's nothing in there that's going to cause an issue down the line. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's still very much a human business. Um, the The bit that's different is that you can do a lot before you engage with that person. And then hopefully you're not going backwards and forwards as much. Yeah. Um, it's a cleaner process. Uh, you, um, the system basically tells you what's required in terms of uploading of information. Um, it knows that if you've got a trust, you're going to need a certain document, or if you've got a loan from a parent, you're going to need something. And mm-hmm. so it's automated all those kind of decisioning things. Um, so when the advisor picks it up, hopefully that, co- that conversation's a lot more to the point yes. and it's it's where it needs to be as opposed to about things that are just annoying. <laughs> Fair enough. So tell me, is there any AI built into it? Uh, not really at not this yet. stage. Yeah, yeah, but there's probably yeah. something in the future that can be... The, yeah. yeah? There's, there's, what, is, what does the future look like? Um, yeah, so the future is that it, it becomes a marketplace for um, financial services really. Right. Um, and... Um, so you get more integration of things. So if you if you're getting a your first home, the insurance elements would get built into that um, journey, mm-hmm. for instance. So you're kind of able to do everything in one spot, um, and your information's not being duplicated in multiple places. It's yeah. been collected once and provided to two different suppliers or whatever it might be to do it. So that's kind of the future: is to um, really make those journeys. A lot more succinct and cleaner, and yeah. less duplication of information, and less duplication of phone calls and relationship points, and all those sorts of things. Um, the AI is going to be there somewhere, and yeah. you know we do things like um, take bank statements and itemize all your spending. Yes, <laughs> and so been through that myself. Yeah, yeah so things yeah. like that are where AI come in handy because mm-hmm. you can start to speed that process up yeah. um, by using automation. Um, we do a lot of, so, you know, just with a basic home loan, we look at the servicing ability of the individual. So yep. how much um, money have they got left over after they service their loan to live on and do all those bits and pieces. And um, we've already built in um, the formulas that the banks are using into our system. So that's all automated. You're not double keying and doing all that sort of stuff. So little things like that um, will just continually um, improve over time. Yeah, there's so much opportunity in the digital space. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so um, I I, I love to share tips and tools with our listeners Mm -hmm. because I think it's really important not only to feel that, yes, they're not alone on this journey, there are people doing it. Uh, What are the the three kind of top tips or tools that you'd like to share? Yeah, yeah. Um, What did I have? I actually wrote this down because I wanted to to give it some thought. But I think... um, I think um, the n- number one thing with owning your own business is to not get caught up in the, the day-to-day and to keep focused on the longer-term vision. Yeah. Um, and because there's always something needed that day from someone for something. Um, there's always a, a short-term period that you're focusing on in terms of achieving something. Yeah. But the business is built from thinking, you know, um, uh, long term. So, you know, I sort of got to get your mindset out of that short term day to day mindset um, and reposition it all the time into what's the longer term outcome goal thing that I'm trying to achieve here. Yeah, don't lose sight of it. Yeah. Yeah, So that's. How do you find time to make sure that you have that clarity of thought? Because it is really important to, to keep, you know, focus on that sort of 10 year picture rather than the day to day stuff. Yeah. Yeah, um, so I think uh, but, uh, there's a f- number of ways, um, but we, um, with Intella, for instance, we focus on that m- at a manage- management level, um, shareholder level. Yep. So we're constantly thinking, and, and this is a great thing with an early stage business, you're constantly looking at capital. Yep. So you're much more focused on valuation and, and where you need to get to in terms of 
um, making sure that valuations are ahead of what you need in capital. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that creates that mindset. Yep. Um, so, um, and I always sort of think that the number one way of actually keeping that long term hat on is to be constantly thinking about exit. Yep. Where's the exit going to come from? Um, because even if it's not the exit that you get in the end, it's it's forcing you to think about um, you know the five year plan as opposed to the twelve months plan. And I think exit is an interesting term because it doesn't necessarily mean that you are going to no, sell the business. No, it's like no. you should be able to not be involved in the That's business. Right. That's what exit really means. So well, is there a way this business could run without yeah, you yeah, being involved yeah, in it day to day? But it's yeah. a bit like um, um, the idea of selling your house in twelve months' time. Well, if you do that, then you're going to maintain it. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're not going to let it run down. No. Yeah. And and it's and that's kind of that um, that gets you into that longer term thinking. Love it. Okay. Yeah. 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 Mm. Next tip. Yeah. Um, what else did I have? Um, oh gosh, I just can't see where I've put them. That's okay. Um, yeah. So. Um, my next tip was uh, empower your people. Yep. So as a small business, um, it's really hard to do everything yourself. It's never going to work. Yeah. <laughs> so you it can means, try. Yeah, and people do, yeah. but yes. So, so it means you Letting really go. you have to let go. Yeah, yeah. and and that's um, really hard for any entrepreneurial person, I think. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I'm still learning to do it, and I'm not very good at it. Me too. Um, <laughs> But uh, and it's going to result in some outcomes that are um, not always good. No. But I think it's going to actually result in more upside than downside, and so it's, it's about getting your head around that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you know, again, coming back to employing people, you want people that are going to come in, um, but uh, and you know that when you give them that empowerment, they're going to run with it and yep. do things with it. They're not going to sit back and wait for you to. Um, ask them to do something. Yeah, and yeah, so that's that's probably my my next for me personally. That's been my biggest challenge is to sort of step aside and let others um, run with things. Yep, um, and to remind them constantly that if they've got ideas or want to bring something to the table, the door's always open. You know, it's sort of like, um, yeah, come and see me, talk to us, sure. um, talk to the team, raise it in a meeting. Um, or just do it and see how it goes and tell us later. You know, like <laughs> yeah, so. Yeah. You know, if it's a small thing, yeah. um, take so, accountability. Yeah, yeah, it. Yep. yeah, yeah. So that was that one. Um, and then the third one is um, is a hard one because it's it's um, probably coming back to that kind of ethos that you've talked about in terms of work life balance. Yes. Um, it's challenging, but I always think of what Elon Musk said when he asked how he was better than his competition. I can't remember which one it was. And he said, it's because I, um, we work twice the hours. <laughs> <laughs> and it's sort of like that. If you're really going to break uh, away from competition, sometimes it just means that you, are, have, you have to be more dedicated and, and put in that extra effort. Yep. Um, doesn't mean that you don't be efficient and and um, make sure that you're putting the hours in the right place. Yep. But you know, um, sometimes those sh- those uh, short pushes make a huge short difference. Spurts of yeah. The big hours, yeah. 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 Okay. I have a lot, one last question for you as well. It just mm. came to my mind. I mean, so in terms, let's just say there's somebody in listening in who's mm. in their cushy corporate job at the moment, mm. thinking yep. about going out into their <laughs> yep. own business. What yep. would be the the number one tip you would give to them? Um, probably not wait as long as I did. <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm 50. Yes. And I kind of wish I'd done something in my 30s because you've got that extra energy when you're young. Yes. Um, and, um, but I know it's hard because you've got family and bits and pieces at that stage that you want stability around. Um, but my number one tip would be um, first to sort of talk to people that are entrepreneurial and out there doing their own things to understand um, that what the difference is, yep. to get your head around um, what it means to step away from a salary and actually take that risk. Mm-hmm. And, and it's not all upside. It's You've, yeah. you've got to... <laughs> well, there's some challenges. You've <laughs> got to be clear of what those challenges are yep. and you've got to have a plan for how you're going to uh, deal with them when they come along. Mm. And and that'll be... Um, the primary one will be cash flow. Yeah. 
you're not going to have that consistency of cash flow. So what happens when you have a month where you've got no income? Or, yeah. We always you know, say you should always have about six months in the bank yeah. just to sort of, yeah. you know, for those times. Because in the 10-year yeah. cycle, you always get a couple of good years, a mm. couple of terrible years, a couple yeah. of years that will actually make you go bankrupt yeah. if you haven't got that money yeah, that's there. Yeah, right. so, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, you've got that cycle that you don't have when you're on a salary. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> um, and I guess also just make sure, I think one of my, my key things is I used to do a lot of market validation work at the ISAS. Is, yeah. You know, you've got to know there's a real need for what you're doing because an idea, yeah. you can talk to friends yeah. and family that all say, yes, fantastic idea, yeah. but there's got to be a real need for it. And you already yeah. knew that because you, of the work you were doing in the bank. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that I've sort of learned a lot just um, – since leaving banking is the importance of sort of benchmarking ideas. Yep. And and so um, I don't actually think it's a great idea to do something that hasn't been tried or tested somewhere else, <laughs> which is a bit unusual because that's not very entrepreneurial. But it doesn't mean you can't do it in a different, slightly different way or, you know, so um, being second is always a great position to be in um, mm-hmm. or to, in our case with Teller, uh, you know, the first platform like what we've done with Teller in Australia was 2013 and the US it was 2015. So we had a lot of resource in terms of benchmarking and understanding what they'd done, how they'd changed, um, yep. what was working, what um, – so – you know, if you've you got an the idea, of that, like trade yeah. me yeah. zero, yeah. all those um, people yeah. have done particularly well. Yeah. They weren't the first to market. No, no. they just did it better. That's right. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. that's that's the key, I think. Um, but I think fresh fresh eyes on everything mm-hmm. give you that ability to go and actually, um, you know, it's like with the tech and teller. We're starting from scratch, so we've got that benefit of. Clean slate. From, clean slate. Building um, from the foundations up. Yeah. yeah, modern technology. Technology that in 2013 didn't, didn't exist. exist yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah. And that's the opportunity for um, being entrepreneurial and starting something um, today as opposed to your competition who might have done it earlier. Perfect, um, yeah. Yeah, but I I, I do think that, um, yeah, we need more entrepreneurs, so take the risk and get out Just there do and it. do it. do it earlier. Yeah, excellent. <laughs> Oh, look, Andrew, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you for sharing all your stuff with me. If people want to get in contact with you, and mm-hmm. if they want to find out about Teller as well, where mm-hmm. would they go to? How do they do that? How do they find me? Yep. Um, probably the easiest way is andrew at teller.co.nz yep. um, or LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, but I'm um, always happy to talk to people. Mm. And teller.co.nz, just to be really clear, that's mm. T-E-L-L-A mm-hmm. dot co.nz. That's and that's your online sort of, how would you describe it in one sentence? Uh, that's our, well, online mortgage broker platform. Yeah, mm. perfect. Okay, mm. great. Look, thank you very yep. much for your time. Okay. Really appreciate it. Thank you.